All right. Well, welcome. Uh, and thank you for joining us again for the portable fire extinguishers. Uh, this is a component of the interior operations uh, training for the CSRD, so um, uh, glad you guys could all make it. All right, now I got to figure out how to change here. All right, so I think I went by two here, didn't I? No. All right, so fire extinguishers, they come in all different sizes and shapes, different types of varieties. Um, we encourage our residents to keep fire extinguishers in their homes, particularly their kitchens. Uh, that's where a majority of our fires are going to start. Most of the extinguishers that we use are easy to operate. Very minimal training is required. Uh, and uh, we do typically get uh, expired fire extinguishers in and we'll bring those in. I'll bring those down to Scotch Creek next week and uh, we'll do our practical. Um, and they vary in size, shape, and what, what, what the uh, extinguishing agent that's being used. Some of the agents that we could use include things like water, uh, water with additives, dry chemicals, dry powders, uh, and sometimes gaseous agents. And each agent is, uh, is, is really set for a specific type of fire, and understanding which types of fire to use which extinguishers on, very important. So the extinguishers are designed for different purposes and they involve different operational methods because of that. So the chapter, the chapter we're going to go through here, it's going to cover what the most appropriate type of fire extinguisher is for different types of fires, um, what kinds must not be used on certain kinds of fires, and the operation, the simple inspection and maintenance of most common portable fire extinguishers. So most of you should be aware, kind of uh, understand, uh, you know, the different types of fires that we could have, class A, B, C. Uh, there's a couple of other ones in here, D and K, which we might not be as familiar with, but these are the five classes uh, that we have for the different types of fire. And we're gonna choose our fire extinguisher based on what is actually on fire here. So I'm gonna go through each one of these uh, individually, but you might see symbols like this on the fire extinguishers at your hall, in your residence, at your place of work. So class A fire extinguishers, and uh, they are good for class A fires. Class A fires include basically just ordinary solid combustibles, things like textiles, paper, plastics, rubber, and wood. Uh, these types of fires can be very, you know, are, are some of the easiest to extinguish and they're extinguished with water um, or water-based agents, which again sucks the heat right out of it and, and, uh, and puts it out that way. And we can also use dry chemicals, which helps interrupt the uh, chemical chain reaction that's happening that creates the fire. So class B, these are basically fires that involve flammable or, com or combustible liquids and gases. Uh, so things like alcohol, gasoline, lubricating oils, and LPG or liquefied petroleum gas, propane, that, those are all examples of class B fires. Uh, these types of fires uh, need a different, uh, different types of extinguishers. You're not going to use water on these. You've got things like carbon dioxide extinguishers. Uh, the dry chemical extinguishers are often very useful on those as well. And we in the fire service would often use class B foam. So class A foam, again, that's for your solid, uh, your, your burning solids uh, and ordinary combustibles. Class B foam would be used on uh, combustible liquids. The next type we'll talk about is class C. So class C fires involve energized electrical equipment. All right, so we can't use water on when, when we have electricity running to it, right? This is, uh, water conducts electricity. Um, so, thing, so water is not going to extinguish, uh, extinguish the fire. And we need to use something that, uh, some kind of extinguishing agent that's not going to conduct electricity when we're battling a class C type fire. Uh, it's, inter it's important to understand as well though, that once we cut the power supply or turn it off, or if it's disconnected, uh, the fire can all, it can now be treated as a class A or B, depending on what's on fire. Uh, so if you have a toaster that's on fire, if it's plugged into the wall, that's an energized, uh, that's a class C fire. As soon as you unplug the toaster, that would now become a class A fire. Uh, <laughs> so again, thinking about that, if we're in a, in a situation where we have some kind of class C fire, finding a way to uh, disconnect the power supply is, uh, is going to definitely help us out. Class D fires. Class D fires typically involve combustible metals and alloys. 
Uh, these can be often identified by the way they burn. They make a very bright white emission during the combustion process. Uh, you might see this in uh, a car fire where the magnesium in the steering column or on the wheels uh, starts burning. It's one of the more common areas we're going to see a class D fire. Um, so you're looking at items like lithium, magnesium, like I said, that, which is commonly used in wheels, uh, transmission components and other and, and often on the you know, rims of, uh, for the wheels uh, for the tires as well. Uh, potassium, sodium, those are other uh, metals that uh, do have a uh, potential for burning. Uh, dry powder extinguishers uh, work best on these kind of things. Uh, not the same as a dry chemical extinguisher. So we don't want to be using one of the ones that are classified as an ABC extinguisher. Very, very different fires. Uh, dry chemical agents react violently when, uh, when they hit a, a burning metal uh, and are applied to a class D fire. Water also reacts very violently when we try to extinguish a class D fire using water. So basically it can cause it causes the fire to react violently. It'll emit bits of molten metal and, and you can possibly injure the uh, firefighters or other people that are close by. Now, class K fires involve combustible cooking oils. Uh, so class K is not one you're gonna see very often, but you, you're definitely, you're, you'll often see uh, class K types of uh, fire control systems in restaurants and, and in the kitchen area there. Um, so, Class K involves things like vegetable, animal fats, uh, oils that can burn at extremely high temperatures, and they're found in commercial and institutional kitchens, industrial cooking facilities, private homes, pretty much anywhere. And we know of situations where, you know, you've probably all seen uh, combustible oils catch fire before, at least I certainly have in my time uh, cooking. Uh, it's, it's something that happens very quickly. So control, we, the way we wanna control these is the use of a wet chemical system. Uh, so class K wet chemical system, and there are class K portable fire extinguishers we can use as well. Another effective technique for putting them out when not using fire extinguishers would be just so, uh, depriving it of the oxygen. So a pot on the stove, we put a lid on, it can often extinguish it, but when they get too big, we're gonna have to start thinking about uh, a class K extinguishing agent. Where are we now? So now the types of uh, portable fire extinguishers uh, vary and uh, for a number of reasons. And one of them is the extinguishing agent. Um, and we organize our extinguishing agent by the type of agent and by the method that's used to expel the contents of that uh, portable fire extinguisher. So Basically to extinguish the fire, we have to interrupt or remove at least one part of the fire tetrahedron. And if we think back to you know, our, our, our classes on fire triangle, fire tetrahedron, and the different components of that. So we want to remove at least one component of that. Uh, and I was, I uh, one of the ways, like I had mentioned before, with the pot on the, st uh, pot on the stove and, and putting the lid on the pot is by, is by smothering. And the smothering excludes the oxygen from the burning process. So you see on the fire tetrahedron here, <laughs> on the right hand side of our PowerPoint, you see that uh, it's, uh, we have oxygen, heat, fuel, and it's all kept together by a chemical chain reaction. So if we remove the oxygen, we've put it out. Uh, cooling is another way we can uh, extinguish, and that's reducing the burning material below its ignition temperature, We're sucking the heat out of it, and, put, and, uh, and, and that's how water works. Um, chain breaking, so breaking that chain in the chemical chain reaction that's part of the tetrahedron, and the dry chemical fire extinguishers are often what's used for that. Uh, saponification is a method that occurs when we mix uh, alcohol-based chemicals and certain cooking oils and they come in contact uh, and what happens is it results in the formation of an oxygen excluding soapy foam surface. So basically saponification it can also be understood as smothering. Basically it's creating an oily surface over top of that burning material and won't let it go any further. Okay. So fuel removal is the only element of the fire tetrahedron that uh, an extinguisher can't actually take care of. So we can't take the fuel out of the equation using a fire extinguisher. But of course, if we want to put out the fire and there is a way to remove the fuel, that's certainly an option for us. All right, so we have a number of different types of portable fire extinguishers, right? They, and they use different mechanisms to expel uh, their contents. Uh, so on the left here, we have a picture of a manual pump. 
the way that works is the operator will physically apply the pressure to the pump the, and uh, that'll increase the pressure within the container. Uh, the, the pressure then forces the, the extinguishing agent out of the nozzle at the end of the hose. There is also stored pressure uh, fire extinguishers. They're, they use compressed air or inert gas of some sort to, uh, within the container <coughs> to, to force the agent out of the nozzle end of, uh, of the hose when the operator presses the handle. And then there's also a pressure cartridge, which you see on the far right of the slide here. Um, the pressure cartridge has a compressed or inert gas contained within it, uh, and that's uh, on, the separate, on a separate side of the container. So when an op and so if somebody operates the fire extinguisher, they puncture the cartridge, the expellent uh, will enter the container and it forces the agent out of the nozzle, uh, out of the nozzle end of the hose. That cartridge can then be replaced. All right, pump type water extinguishers. These are primarily intended for use on ground cover fires. All right, so the wildland type fires, you might see these with a backpack, we have backpacks. <clears throat> that we'll use, they carry the water on the back, and you'll have something very similar to what, you, what this uh, firefighter has in their hand here, a wand <clears throat> that you can then move back and forth uh, to create the pressure in there, and, uh, and basically that creates the pressure inside, which will then expel the water out the nozzle. Uh, these are desi often designed to be worn on the back, uh, and the nozzle is going to produce basically just a straight stream. It can, in some, in some situations, also be used to uh, do a fog or a water mist pattern as well. Okay, stored pressure water extinguishers. These are also called air pressurized water or pressurized water, APW is another way to think of these. Um, these are useful for any kind of class A fire. Um, often these are used uh, for extinguishing basically hot spots uh, during overhaul operations. Uh, and the way that they work is basically water is stored in a tank along with either a compressed air or nitrogen. Uh, there's a gauge located on the side uh, on the side of the valve that uh, valve assembly that shows when it's fully pressurized. Um, and when you're operating a valve activated store, uh, a valve uh, the, operating the valve activated, um, stored pressure forces water up the siphon tube and then out through the hose. All right, class A foam concentrate is also sometimes added to, uh, to these types of extinguishers and that helps increase the effectiveness, right? The, uh, the foam will serve as a wetting agent. It aids in extinguishing deep seated fires. So it actually makes the water wetter. Uh, if you remember your grade nine science and talking about soap and how it uh, reduces the surface tension, uh, the foam will actually do that. Uh, and it also enhances effectiveness by reduce, uh, by uh, by having in, including an extinguishing agent in the foam. All right, then there's wet chemical stored pressure extinguishers. Uh, these are very similar in appearance to the stored pressure water extinguishers, uh, but these are intended for use on on class K fires. So remember that uh, wet chemical stored pressure extinguishers intended for class K fires. Uh, these contain a special potassium-based kind of low pH agent. It's uh, formulated to operate on the principle of saponification. If you remember, it'll create, uh, it, so it basically smothers uh, and creates an oily film that goes on top of the burning material and then smothers it. So it removes the oxygen from the fire tetrahedron. Uh, the agent will combine with the oils, creates that soapy foam surface over the cooking appliance. <clears throat> Some departments may carry this, uh, but I don't know if we have any in the CSRD. So the next one I'll talk about is the aqueous film forming foam, AFFF or AFFF extinguisher. Uh, these are intended for use on the class B fires. Uh, these are useful for, com uh, for combating fire in or suppressing vapors from small liquid fuel spills. So if you have a small spill on the side of the room, this is a great way to, to handle that if it's just a small spill. Uh, these are very different from stored pressure water extinguishers uh, th because the tank contains a specified amount of the AFFF concentrate with water to produce that foam solution. It has an air aspirating foam nozzle. So what the air aspirating foam nozzle does is it actually in, uh, it adds air to the foam as it's leaving the nozzle. So that's going to produce a better quality foam and have better extinguishing characteristics to that foam. Um, water and AFFF uh, solution expelled using, is expelled using a compressed air, or sometimes also they use nitrogen stored in a tank uh, with the solution. 
Uh, the resulting foam from these types of extinguishers floats on the surface of fuels uh, and is actually uh, the, of fuels uh, that are lighter than air. Uh, a vapor seal is created by the film and extinguishes the flame and prevents ignition uh, and, or reignition. Uh, and we want to be sure when we apply these that we, we want to prevent any kind of disturbance to that, uh, to that vapor seal that's been created. Um, we don't want to apply it directly onto the fuel. Uh, if you guys remember from our exterior training, we tend, uh, the rain down met method uh, is a good method to use or the deflecting method by uh, bouncing it off of a, a back wall. So by raining down, we, sh we shoot it up into the air and allow it to come down. And by banking it off the wall, again, that's pretty straightforward. We're trying to hit, hit it off of an object. Uh, and what that's going to then do is, uh, is, is it's going to land more gently on the burning materials, not scatter them around, uh, create more fire all over the place. And it also adds air to it and keeps the air that's included in it already, that's in that foam uh, in it, as opposed to actually, you know, bursting the bubbles and making it less effective. So this type of uh, extinguisher is most effective on like static pools of flammable liquid. So something that's moving, not as effective, uh, most effective when, when, when it's pooled somewhere and we want to we wanna safety that area. Uh, these types of extinguishers are not suitable for things like uh, class D fires, uh, or sorry, class D fires, C fires, class K fires. Um, we don't use it for those kind of things. <clears throat> um, it's also not very useful for fires that are, uh, or fuel when it's flowing down from an elevated point. So if it's coming at you, it's, it, these type of extinguishers aren't going to do a great job. Um, and the last one that I, that you don't want to use it on is fuel that's under, pre uh, under pressure, uh, and spraying from a leaking flange or, uh, or a tank of some sort. All right, clean agent extinguishers. All right, the mo uh, these uh, clean agent extinguishers basically extremely ex effective for extinguishing fires in computer rooms, uh, aircraft engines, uh, you know, very high valued, delicate machinery, uh, areas that uh, contain materials that are easily damaged by waters or dry chemical agents. Uh, the most common that, uh, that you'll find out there are, are halon extinguishers, and they have numbers halon 1211, halon uh, 1301. Those are the most common ones you'll find. Uh, problem with the, one of the problems with these types of extinguishers is they're very damaging to the ozone layer. Uh, not very good for the environment, uh, but again, when we're trying to protect sensitive equipment, we don't use these for everything. They're just used in these very specific situations. Uh, and to use a halon extinguisher, we want to discharge it as rapid, it, it basically, it discharges, when it discharges, it, it, it's a rapidly evaporating liquid. Uh, it doesn't leave any residue behind once it, uh, once it completely evaporates. Uh, it will effectively cool, smother fires in class A and B fuels, and it's not conductive, which again is why it works very well around, uh, air, you know, very uh, computer equipment, airplanes, and things like that. All right, carbon dioxide fire extinguishers. So these can be found both, uh, you can have the handheld units, they have the wheeled units, uh, and these are most effective in extinguishing class B and C fires. So flammable liquids and uh, energized electrical devices. Uh, so these types of extinguishers are, I mean, the, the extinguishing agent is, dis is carbon dioxide, it's discharged in the form of a gas. Uh, it doesn't have a very long reach because of that, um, and the wind will play a role in, and can end up dispersing the carbon dioxide and making it less effective. Um, it does not require freeze protection, unlike, you know, if we're using water extinguishers, though. Uh, to operate one of these types of extinguishers, uh, the carbon dioxide is stored under its own pressure as liquefied gas, and it's ready for release. Uh, it's it's discharged through a plastic or a rubber horn at the end of either a short hose or a tube. Uh, the discharge is usually accompanied by dry ice crystals or carbon dioxide snow, as it's sometimes known as well. So you might see that. Uh, carbon dioxide gas displaces oxygen and then smothers the fire. So that's how it works, basically. The oxygen is pushed away. And again, we need that from the fire tetrahedron. And, uh, and so with the oxygen removal, fire goes out. Uh, it doesn't do much for cooling. Uh, some people believe that that is, uh, you know, one of the uh, effects of using a carbon dioxide extinguisher. It's not. It's, it's for smothering. 
uh, produces very uh, like no vapor basically uh, <clears throat> and uh, reignition can always be a danger so it doesn't really suppress it it doesn't stay in place uh, as soon as you've discharged it it's basically you know whatever you've done is over and it could reignite um, it does have wheel there are wheeled units with uh, that are carbon dioxide extinguisher they're basically the same kind of thing they're just larger uh, you're looking at 50 to 100 pounds uh, sometimes you can get for these types of extinguishers uh, and those types you'll find more commonly in places like airports and industrial facilities. Um, the hose has to be often unwound before you're able to use these types of wheeled extinguishers, but they operate basically the exact same as the handheld. <clears throat> Dry chemical extinguishers. All right, these are for use on class A, B, C fires. So the dry chemical, this is one that we, we should all be very familiar with. Uh, most of us are going to have uh, these on our fire trucks. Uh, they're good because they, they have so many uh, different types of fires that they are good for, right? Um, but you can have different types as well that are reg that uh, are just BC rated. You can get multi-purpose ABC chemical uh, rated uh, dry chemical extinguishers. And basically the way these work, like the agents inside are mixed with small amounts of additives during manufacturing. So what those additives do is they prevent caking on the inside of this, uh, this dry chemical. And it keeps the agents ready to use even after long storage periods and makes them free flowing. <coughs> um, we never want to mix or contaminate uh, with any other type of agent. The dry chem that's in there, we don't put something else in as well. Uh, those chemicals might react together, right? And that could cause a dangerous rise in pressure inside the extinguisher and cause a failure at some point. And by failure, I mean a big boom. Uh, the agents are non-toxic, generally considered to be fairly safe to use. Um, the cloud may, may reduce visibility when you discharge it, and they can create respiratory problems. Um, certainly not, com not always compatible with foam. Uh, because it is two different types of chemicals and reactions can occur with that. On class A fires, basically how we're what we're looking to do is we want to, uh, to directly discharge at whatever is burning to cover, uh, to cover that, uh, the, the seat of the fire with the chemical. <clears throat> Once the flame's knocked down, we're going to just apply the chemical as we need to get any of the other little smoldering areas and try to prevent it from rekindling. Uh, can be, the, the dry chemical can be mildly corrosive, so that's important to note as well. Uh, if it's on something that uh, could corrode or rust, we may want to try and get it off if we're trying to salvage and save that. Uh, with handheld units, we have two basic de designs, and that's the cartridge operated, uh, which has that pressure cartridge, if you remember from the earlier slide, uh, and that cartridge is connected to the tank. Uh, and then uh, the t for in this case, uh, in, in those cases, the, the tank's not pressurized until the plunger is pushed to release the gas. So by pushing the plunger, it actually breaches that cartridge and gets the gas to go into the container, which will then force the extinguishing agent out through the hose. Um, the other type is the stored pressure uh, extinguisher. And it's sim that's similar to the air pressurized water extinguisher. Uh, basically, it has a constant pressure of about 200 PSI. Uh, for wheeled units, and they basically they're similar to the handheld units, only larger, right? Uh, they are often rated for the ABC type fires based on the chemical that's in that unit. And uh, basically the agent is kept in, in a tank uh, and pressurized uh, gas is contained in a separate cylinder. Uh, when in position at a fire, we stretch the hose out. Um, once charged, uh, remove. It's, it, once it's charged, taking that hose out is going to be much more difficult uh, because of the clogs and bends that happen down. So make sure the hose is completely deployed if you have a wheeled dry chemical unit. <coughs> um, the, we will then uh, press the lever. It's going to introduce the pressurizing gas and allow a few seconds to fully pressurize before you open the nozzle. Uh, you, you need to be uh, prepared as well for a, a significant nozzle reaction when it's operated. There is a bit of pushback, so just be ready for that and have your feet set uh, same way you would when operating handline. We're then going to apply the agent in a similar manner as we would with the handheld. Now there's the dry powder extinguisher. So again, two different types, dry chemical and dry powder extinguishers. So basically the dry powder were developed to control and extinguish fires that are involving class D combustible metals. 
uh, no single method will control all combustible metals. So, um, so you know, they work on, on a number of them, but it's not going to work on everything. Uh, we need to remember that appropriate application techniques uh, need to be used, and that's based on whatever the manu manufacturer's guide is. <laughs> there are all sorts of, uh, all different types of these dry powdered extinguishers. Make sure you know which one you're operating and how to use it. <clears throat> so, Basically, again, these come in both handheld and wheeled models. Handheld smaller, wheeled is going to be larger. Um, they need to be, and you need to apply enough powder uh, in, a, in a sufficient depth for it to completely cover the burning area and in order to create that smothering blanket. Um, it can be applied with the extinguisher or you can also use a scoop actually with dry powder. Uh, you can use a scoop to apply it right onto, uh, onto the burning materials. Uh, it should be applied gently to avoid breaking the crust of the, uh, that may form over the burning materials. So as you put it on, uh, you're actually, it, the fire will actually uh, start to create a crust in this dry powder and that crust aids the smothering. If we break that crust, we're now introducing oxygen back into the fire and it will relight. We also want to avoid when we're uh, deploying one of these, we want to avoid scattering the metals around, right? Uh, so we don't want to put it, push you know, too, too much pressure at the burning metals. Uh, we'll just apply it over hot spots as necessary. <clears throat> um, if a small amount of burning metal is on a combustible surface, we just want to cover it with the powder, um, layer the powder about one to two inches, uh, you know, 25 millimeters to 50 millimeters deep. Um, and, uh, and spread it, um, add more as you need it. After it's, after it's extinguished, we can just leave the material undisturbed until, it, the, until it's completely cooled. Uh, and, and then we can attempt disposal after that. Uh, we don't wanna be touching it too soon. Make sure that the fire is out. So I touched on it briefly at the beginning, uh, which was the fire extinguisher rating system. Um, and again, these, they're, they're the fire extinguishers are rated according to their performance. Um, these are based on tests that are conducted by the under, Underwriter Laboratories Incorporated and the Underwriter Laboratories of Canada, so the ULC. So when we look at a class A rating, uh, basically they can be rated from 1A to 40A, as you can see on the chart on the left there. Um, and this is primarily based on the amount of extinguishing agent uh, and the duration and range of the discharge for that particular extinguisher. Uh, a 1A requires about one and three quarter gallons of water. Uh, 2A requires two and a half gallons uh, or 10 liters of water. So again, these are, you know, for the class A specifically, you're looking at, you know, water in those. Uh, class B ratings, that's going to range from a, a 1B to a 640B. Uh, this, is based on base, this is based on the approximate square footage um, that, uh, of the area that uh, the flammable liquid uh, can, can, can uh, extinguish. And that's by use by a non-expert, right? So somebody who just picked it up today, uh, and when to extinguish it, how big of an area can they expect to get extinguished with this uh, particular extinguisher? We expect to, basically, we expect to extinguish about one square foot for each rating. So again, the, you know, uh, 640B, that's gonna be 640 square feet that you'd be able to uh, extinguish with that extinguisher. So the class C ratings, um, there are no capability tests specifically for, for the class C. Uh, these fires are essentially a class A or B with an energized, with energized equipment, right? So as soon as the, uh, you know, as soon as we remove the, uh, de-energize it, we remove the power source, it's now a class A. Um, Class, uh, the tests conducted to test this agent for electrical non-conductivity uh, and the rating there is going to basically confirm if the agent is non-conductive. Uh, and these are assigned in addition to class A or class Bs. Then class D uh, fire extinguishers, the tests uh, vary based on the type of combustible we're trying to extinguish, uh, the type of combustible metal we're trying to extinguish. Uh, we need to consider a few factors, things like what are the reactions between the metal and the agent? Uh, what is the toxicity of the agent, the toxicity of the fumes produced and the, the products of combustion? And 
what time what's the time allowed that uh, that is allowed for the metal to continue burning uh without fire suppression compared to the time it takes for us to extinguish it using that extinguisher so <clears throat> the application instructions are included on the faceplate of the extinguisher no there's no number rating system on it uh, and these types of extinguishers cannot be used on other classes of fire so for the class K ratings, uh, all class K ratings, they must be capable of that, uh, of saponifying. Uh, so if you remember what we were talking about that, it needs to be able to create that, that, sur that surface, uh, that smothering surface over top. Um, so it needs to be able to, uh, capable of saponifying specific uh, things as well. And that includes vegetable oil, peanut oil, canola oil, um, and other oils with little or no fatty acids. Uh, and these types of extinguisher contain an alkaline mixture and they work by suppressing the vapors and smothering the fire. So the minimum criteria for these is they have to be capable of extinguishing fire from a deep fryer uh, using light oils with a, a surface area of about 2.25 square feet or 0.2 meters. If an extinguisher has multiple markings, uh, these can often be identified by combinations of letters. The most common we're gonna find out there are things like ABC, class AB, uh, BC. Um, any that aren't marked as multi-purpose should not be used for a fire other than what it's intended, all right? And the ratings for each of these classes are separate. They don't affect each other. Rating in one class is not gonna affect the rating in another class. So these portable extinguishers are identified in two ways. Um, uh, and we use things like the geometric shapes, as you see on the rating, uh, the rating symbol on the, on the uh, picture on the right of the PowerPoint. Uh, and these are specific shapes with colors and the class letters shown within the shapes. Uh, the other way is the pictographs, which again is just to the right of those letters. Um, and uh, these are recommended in NFPA 10. Uh, they show the types of fires that you, they often will also show the types of fires you don't want to use them on. And again, these are good because we can all understand them. Uh, they don't, it doesn't matter. They translate into any language uh, and uh, you don't have to speak English or understand the English alphabet to be able to, uh, to understand what type of extinguisher you have. So how do we select the proper fire extinguisher? So we, there's a lot of fa factors we want to take into, in, into consideration. And we want to choose it so that it's, we're going to minimize the risk to life and property. That's our job, right? Uh, is that, and, and we want to make sure that that's, the fire extinguisher we choose is going to be effective at extinguishing the fire that we're having to deal with. So some of the things we need to consider, uh, what is the classification of the burning fuel, right? Is it an A, B, C, D? Uh, so this one in the waiting room. Um, what is the rating of the fire extinguisher? Uh, what are the hazards that we're trying to protect? What is the size of intens and intensity of the fire that we're trying to fight? Uh, atmospheric conditions. So again, with the carbon dioxide, we're going to start getting the blowback. If it's too windy out, that's not going to work. Uh, how about the availability of trained personnel? Some extinguishers take a, a, a higher level of training to be able to operate. And if we don't have people trained and able to operate them, we can't use them. Uh, and what is the ease of handling the extinguisher? And are there any life hazard or operational concerns we need to keep in mind? <coughs> Excuse me. In areas where we have highly sensitized, uh, sensitive sorry, computer equipment, uh, remember, don't ever select a dry chemical. The residue could cause far more damage than the fire is causing at the beginning. Uh, use a clean agent of some sort or a carbon dioxide. Did I change? Nope. All right, so using a portable fire extinguisher. Uh, the operating procedures are very similar across the board, uh, but we need to be familiar with the detailed instruction found on the labels as well. After we uh, choose the right uh, extinguisher for us, based on, you know, what the right size, uh, the type of the right make, um, and we, do a, we want to do a quick visual inspection on the extinguisher. Uh, this visual inspection is required. It, it's, it helps us ensure that it's fully charged and operable, and it may protect us from injury caused by defective or depleted uh, extinguishers. I can tell you, you know, I, I did one time where I worked uh, and I helped volunteer uh, for the demolition derby that the uh, Salmon Arm Ro and uh, Road Rescue puts on in town. 
Um, so they asked me to come and do fire, you know, be a firefighter there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they gave me a whole bunch of fire extinguishers to use uh, and used almost all of them by the end of it. Uh, but while the cars were waiting to come in, uh, basically, uh, you know, I'm sitting there, had my jacket off, and all of a sudden, uh, the car just burst into flames, just sitting there idling, basically. So jumped up, grabbed a, grabbed a couple of extinguishers, ran over there. First one I went to discharge, didn't work. Second one I went to discharge, also didn't work, ended up throwing it at the car, went back, grabbed a couple more. They thankfully worked, but probably would have saved myself some time if I actually had to check the charging on them before I did that. Things that, you, things that you want to check are like the external condition of it. Make sure we don't have any apparent damage. Uh, make sure that the hose and nozzle are in place. Uh, feel the weight. Does it feel as though it contains an agent? Make sure there's something in there. Uh, and look at the pressure gauge, right? If there's one available on this uh, on the extinguisher you're using. Uh, make sure that it's in that operable range, that green range on most extinguishers. So here are some of the general steps for, uh, for using a fire extinguisher. All right, we want to approach the fire from the windward side with the wind at our back. Uh, we want to pick it up by the handles and carry it to the point of application. And then we want to use the pass application method. All right, and the pass application method I have on the, on the right there. You can see uh, the P is pull the pin. Often it's just, again, there's a little pin, almost like a grenade, pull that out. Uh, might be a, you know, a thin wire or a plastic seal as well. We then want to aim. And where we aim is at the base of the, uh, at the base of the fire, right at the seat of the fire, right? We then, the next, the next one is S and that's for squeezing the handle together to release the agent. And then the last S is to sweep from side to side, back and forth, cover the burning material. All right, we want to make sure that the agent, that the extinguishing agent is going to reach the fire. Um, some small extinguishers may require a closer approach than the larger ones. So be aware when you're, if you're taking a small extinguisher, you're going to have to be much more up close and personal with that fire. Um, wind conditions can limit the reach of the agent. Uh, but remember that when we do end up getting closer to it, operating close to the fire can also scatter any lightweight uh, solid fuels or penetrate the surface of liquid fuels. So we want to be at the right distance, not too close, not too far. We want to apply, so yeah, we want to apply from a point where it reaches, but does not disturb the surface fuels. Um, we're, and then releasing the handle is, is basically how we're going to stop the flow of that extinguishing agent. So after we've done that, hopefully the fire is reduced in size a bit. Um, but you know, if if it's not achieved after uh, an entire extinguisher is discharged, we need to withdraw re and reassess the situation. Uh, this is you know, if it becomes too big for for a situation, uh, we may have to start thinking about using hand lines and other techniques for putting this out. If a solid fuel has been uh, reduced to the smolder phase, we may want to begin, uh, may want to do some overhaul as well, uh, using the appropriate tool, whatever it is. May do what we need to do to make sure we put that fire completely out. Uh, if it's a liquid fuel, it may be necessary to apply the appropriate type of foam to prevent re reignition. So a portable fire extinguisher is basically like a first aid appliance. It does not take place. It, it does not take. It does not take place of the appropriate sized hose line. It's just kind of a band aid. It's something we can use quick. Can hit it fast, but it's not. You know, we'll never be replacing our hose lines and putting a bunch of fire extinguishers on our truck. If we're using uh, more than one simultaneously, so we have two people using fire extinguishers, make sure we're working in unison. Work as a team. Communicate. You don't want to be spraying it onto your uh, onto your partner, and you want to use that uh, extinguishing agent effectively as you're going. Uh, we uh, the, and we also once we've done that, we want to make sure that we identify you know a, a spent extinguisher. Uh, nothing worse than going to a fire, find you know using an extinguisher, discharging the contents, and then somebody else puts it back on the truck and for the next time, and then you go to use it and it's out. So. The way I like to do it is uh, laying empty extinguishers on their side after they're used. That's a, that's a sign that this extinguisher is no longer uh, is no longer usable and needs to be recharged. Quick bit about inspection, care, and maintenance of portable fire extinguishers. Um, for our fire departments, portable fire, uh, the, the, the portable fire extinguishers are specified by the department's uh, uh, own standards and guidelines. 
Um, the fire extinguishers are often based on NFPA 10 requirements. So you see, I put it up there, NFPA 10, that's the standard for portable fire extinguishers. Um, for extinguishers that are privately owned, they're regulated by locally adopted codes or standards. So inspections of our fire extinguishers um, on NFPA 10, it requires inspection at least once a year. All right, it's uh, very important to remember. Uh, the department should have, so it will likely have the standard operating guidelines and I, I'm not sure if they're actually in ours about how often we do that, but we do have a policy, an unwritten policy that we're checking our fire extinguishers annually. Uh, and the factors that are going to determine how, you know, the value of an extinguisher are things like its serviceability, its accessibility, simplicity of operation. So it's great that you have a fire extinguisher, but if you, if, if you can't service it, what good is it to you? If you have no access to it, if it's not in the right place, what good is it to you? And if it's, a, if it's too difficult to operate, again, not going to be much use to us. So for an inspection, we want to make sure that the extinguisher is in the right location, first thing, right? Is it where we want it to be? We should all have, know where our fire extinguishers are on our apparatus, in our fire halls, uh, in our homes, and uh, is it there uh, and is it accessible? We want to inspect the discharge nozzle or, ho or horn, make sure there's no obstructions. And again, this isn't when we go to, to use it, this is for inspecting in between. Um, we want to check the hose for cracks and dirt, grease accumulations, things like that. Uh, inspect the extinguisher container shell for any physical damage. We want to check to see if the operating instructions on the nameplate are legible. Uh, check the locking pin and the, and the tamper seal to ensure that the extinguisher has not been discharged or tampered with. Uh, we want to determine if the extinguisher is full uh, and if it's fully pressurized. We can check the pressure gauge. Um, sometimes uh, in some extinguishers, you may have to actually weigh the extinguisher or, or, in, or visually inspect the agent level. Uh, if it's found that, uh, that that's deficient, you want to basically, if the weight is down by 10%, has to be removed from service and replaced. All right. Remember that, that 10% is very, uh, you know, if it's down just a little bit, it's time to take it out and, uh, and, uh, and replace it. We want to check the inspection tag on it as well. And the inspection tag, I got a little slide of it right there on the right of this, uh, of this PowerPoint slide. Um, we want to look for the date of the previous inspection. We want to look for any maintenance uh, or recharging that's taken place. That should all be indicated on there. If any of them, if any extinguishers are deficient, we're going to remove them from service, right? We're going to replace it with, uh, with an extinguisher that's going to work. And uh, we'll report the needs up the chain of command in our fire halls. Let the, you know, uh, whoever it is you're supposed to be reporting it to up the chain of command, let them know uh, and make sure it gets taken care of. Only trained personnel are, uh, should uh, repair or refill extinguishers. And we actually uh, you know, bring a contractor in to do all of ours. They'll do all the ones on your apparatus, all the ones for your fire hall. Uh, and it's not something that we take on ourselves. Some general thoughts on the care of fire extinguishers. Um, so a few things that are pretty important there. Uh, we don't want to drop or throw our fire extinguishers. Um, the guy on the left is definitely uh, not doing what we should be doing. Um, depending on the size and the weight, we want to carry it diagonally across our body with one hand on the, ha uh, on the handle and the other will be at the bottom. So actually carry it up kind of close to your, uh, up across your body and uh, not just down to your side drag, uh, dragging on the ground. Uh, we're not going to want to remove the safety pin, the safety pin until it's ready to use. All right, if we open, if we take it out thinking I'm going to walk over, you know, take it out, walk over there, we're going to discharge our chemical before we even have a chance to put it where it needs to be. Uh, we want to we want to store them always very securely on the apparatus uh, or in the facility on the mounting bracket that's provided. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we want to lay those uh, empty extinguishers on their side to indicate that they're out of service. So if if you've come across a fire extinguisher that's out of sight uh, on its side, assume that it's out of service. And uh, this is one way that we can if if you want to check it, take a look at it. You can always see, um, but uh, but that's a good way of indicating that it's out of service. Uh, don't store or stack any kind of items uh, in front of the wall mounted fire extinguishers. I oftentimes you'll go to fire halls or houses and you'll see, you know, they've got a fire extinguisher, it's great, but they've, you know, they've put something in front of it, a bookshelf or something. Uh, maybe they've stacked their water right there and it's harder to get at. Never do that. All right. Always has to be easy to get at. 
And uh, with the dry chemical extinguishers, uh, it's a good idea to shake them monthly to loosen the agent. That helps prevent it from settling. Like uh, basically that middle photo there shows you a guy shaking the fire extinguisher. Get that dry, that, uh, that uh, chemical extinguisher, uh, dry chem extinguisher, all the agent to turn back into a powder basically. So for cleaning them, uh, we want to clean them basically after use, or you know, if we're if uh, if it's going to be recharged, you could clean it before it gets uh, service, um, uh, or before, uh, bef yeah, before we recharge it. Um, the way we do that, just using so warm water, some soap, that's going to help us remove any dirt, grease, other foreign materials, and maybe on the exterior of the extinguisher. Um, definitely avoid any kind of solvents that might damage the plastic parts on it um, and uh, remove any corrosion with a steel wool or sandpaper and uh, the refill the recharge or refill has to be performed by trained personnel and again not our personnel we have a uh, contractors that we uh, bring in to do that uh, to do our recharging and refilling it's also a good thing to know um, when there is a recall. Uh, I know I had a number of fire extinguishers available at the CSRD that we had been uh, you know, using as giveaways at different open houses and things like that. Uh, they had a plastic, uh, uh, a plastic uh, um, handle on them that ended up actually breaking uh, when you tried to depress the lever for discharging the agent, uh, which is obviously not very ideal in a situation where you're trying to extinguish a fire. So, you know, keep on top of those. If you find out that there is a recall, make sure you take it out of service. So the maintenance of fire, of, uh, fire extinguishers, um, we should take them out of service annually for a thorough inspection and a disassembly of the unit. And uh, they should uh, be, pre the pre any pressurized uh, extinguishers have to be hydrostatically tested as well. Uh, this is all laid out in NFPA 10. Um, it's required by Transport Canada, so if we're transporting the fire extinguishers, which we are on our apparatus, we need to keep on top of that. And the test results of the hydrostatic testing should be affixed to the shell of the extinguisher. Um, another thing that we should do for maintenance is we should empty any dry chemical every six years and, uh, and refill. Uh, this must be done in a controlled atmosphere and again, done by qualified trained personnel, and in our case, it's by external contractors. All right, well, we've come to the end. Uh, basically, you know, portable fire extinguishers, they can control and extinguish uh, little small fires and uh, early growth fires uh, and do it quickly. Um, so, it, so it doesn't get to be a big fire and something uh, larger that we need to deal with. Uh, we have to be familiar with the characteristics of each fire extinguisher to be able to select and use them properly. Not only should you be familiar with their characteristics and able to select them and use them properly, but you also have to be able to educate the public. So knowing this stuff inside and out is very important. Understanding the idea of pass, you know, uh, you know, pull the pin, aim, squeeze the lever and, and sweep. Knowing those, you know, and, and going through, these are great things on public education, right? Uh, and uh, going around for open houses at school events, things like that. Fire extinguishers are, are uh, a great teaching, teaching tool. Uh, inspecting, carrying, maintaining our ex extinguishers uh, is also important skills uh, and important for us to, to do and make sure that it's taken care of. And as I mentioned, we make sure that we're there, we have our annual inspections and during our duty cruise, let's take them out, make sure they're in good shape and ready for us when we need them. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I will stop the video now and we will, we can, uh, oops, take some, and if there's any questions, uh, you can ask me now. Hold on a second.